everyone, my name is Sarah and today we're going to be learning about how dogs' companionship abilities were inherited from wolves. Pretty interesting stuff. So for those of you at home, how many of you own a dog? Very cool. When I was young, I had three dogs, Daisy, Denny, and Rosie. Uh, Daisy and Denny were both golden retrievers, so they're really, really big, kind of blonde looking dogs. Oh, Daisy was really, really fat though. Um, some people thought she was, she looked like a cow or a horse. Yeah, she was a really good girl. And then my third dog, Rosie, was a beagle. So she was a hunting dog. So she, she loved to, how should I say it? She loved to sing in the middle of the night and uh, I shared a room with her. So, you know, that, that was my first roommate, I guess you could say. So um, I, I've had a really, really good experience growing up with dogs. I, I really wish that I could have one here in Korea too. My, my house is a little bit too small. But anyway, um, throughout history and throughout many different cultures, dogs have been able to bond with humans or develop companionship abilities more than pretty much any other animal. I think some people have cats and cats make great pets as well, but cats, they don't come up to you like this. They don't run to you when you enter the door. Uh, but dogs, they're very loyal and they're very happy to see their owners usually. So how exactly did this relationship develop? It's a pretty interesting question when you think about it. So we're going to learn all about that in today's article. All right, are you ready? Okay, so you can see this ancient, or maybe not ancient, but pretty old photo of a woman from, I think she was Dutch, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, this uh, European looking queen, or maybe she was an aristocrat, um, and she's here with her dog. So we can see that going back several centuries and maybe even thousands of years, dogs and humans have been friends, right? So for centuries, Dogs have been known as man's best friend. From the German Shepherd, to the Afghan Hound, to the Japanese Shiba Inu, dogs of every shape and size can be found perched next to their owners in art from civilizations around the world going back centuries. So here we see a painting of this woman in Europe with her dog, but if we look at art from Afghanistan, from Japan, from Germany, from lots of different cultures, we can see that dogs and humans, they've been, they've been friends for a really long time. And so in these photos, or in these paintings, in a lot of cases, the dogs can be found perched next to their owners. So perched, that means um, you're sitting, but kind of attentively. So for instance, a, for instance, if you go outside and you look at an electrical line, a lot of times there will be birds perched on the electrical lines, right? So basically that means, so if someone is just sitting in their chair like this, that's not perched. But if someone is sitting like this, very attentively, very straight posture, you could say that they're perched on their chair, or in this case, perched on their owner's lap. And we can see these kinds of depictions of humans and dogs in many different civilizations. So um, throughout history, there have been many great kingdoms and civilizations. There was the Chinese civilization, the Mesopotamian civilization, as well as many distinct and unique civilizations in North America before the Europeans went there. Um, so it's, pre it's pretty interesting because all of these places, they're pretty different. But one thing that most of them have in common is the special relationship between humans and dogs. And this relationship has caused dogs to be known as man's best friend. So this is a very commonly used expression when talking about dogs in English. So if you like dogs, then it's probably a good one to remember. All right, second sentence. All right, so. We just said that dogs and humans, they've been friends basically forever, basically everywhere. But why, why is that? So how did dogs end up by our side? Scientists have long assumed that it was humans 
that domesticated ancient canines. But recent evidence suggests that it may have been the other way around. Very intriguing, very interesting. So I, like these scientists, I also assumed that humans domesticated dogs or ancient canines. So when you assume something, you just guess it to be true. You don't double check. You're just like, oh, you know, probably that's the case. So I assume that that's the case. So if we think about it, a lot of times human beings, they kind of imagine themselves as kind of like the rulers of the earth and we're above all of the other animals and plants in the ecosphere. Um, so I guess, so if you take this as fact, it kind of makes sense that someone would assume that humans were the ones who domesticated ancient canines or dogs. So this word domesticate, domesticate, so um, it's a little bit of a tricky word to explain, but I'll do my best. So to, so domestic, this first part of this word, domestic, that means at home, right? And then kate, it's kind of like eyes, I-Z-E, or in Korean you would say hua, so like minju hua, or um, cha dong hua. So that hua, it kind of means what this word here, domesticated, this N part means. So when humans domesticated canines or dogs, they made it so the dogs could live with them in their house. They made it so the humans and the dogs have a special relationship where they work together to hunt, to do farming, or even just to be friends. So for a long time, people thought, oh, we know, of course, humans are so smart. Of course, it was the humans that domesticated the dogs. How could it be any other way? But recent evidence suggests that it might have been the other way around. So maybe it was the dogs that domesticated us, or even the dogs who domesticated themselves. This is kind of an interesting proposal, right? New evidence suggests that it was more likely wolves approached humans before humans approached wolves for companionship. So, I mean, I think right now, you know, me living in the 21st century, if a wolf were to approach me, I would be very scared and I would almost never approach a wolf myself. I don't want to die. I don't want to get eaten. I assume, I guess, that people living in ancient times probably thought the same way. So, that's why it, it kind of makes sense that perhaps it was wolves that approached humans first. And they approached, according to this theory, the wolves approached the humans for companionship. So companionship, it's kind of like friendship. Or, um, it's kind of like friendship or partnership. So having a husband or a wife, that can be called a form of companionship. Having good friends, that's also a form of companionship. Or you can even be referring to a relationship with your brother or your sister or your cousin or anyone else who is close to you. So, hmm, I wonder what it is that wolves saw in humans that they thought, you know, we could be companions or be friends. This is kind of an interesting proposition. For a long time, scientists assumed that some soft-hearted caveman took in some wolf puppies and raised them until Darwinian adaptations turned them from apex predators to floppy-eared friends. So this, <laughs> this sentence has quite a few tricky words, so I'll explain them for you. So uh, when someone has a soft heart, um, that means that they are they're very open to others, they, they care a lot about others, they want to make others feel good, they want to help others feel happy. So, you know, nowadays there are people who are soft-hearted as well as cold-hearted. Likely it was also the same back in the days of the caveman, right here. Um, so scientists, they thought, well, you know, probably some kind of soft-hearted caveman, he adopted some wolf puppies and he raised them or kept them by his side until Darwinian adaptations 
change them. So, okay, this word Darwinian, it looks a little bit hard, but let's think. So, you guys know who Charles Darwin is, right? Yes, so Charles Darwin, he came up with the theory of evolution, right? So, it's when animals, plants, or other types of organisms, through evolution, they change little bit by little bit over time until eventually they diverge or split into completely different species. So, according to these scientists, after the soft-hearted caveman adopted the wolf puppies, um, he kept them presumably for several generations of puppies and also humans, and eventually the puppies became more and more acclimated to being around humans that their physical attributes began to change. Because, for instance, wolves, um, they have special evolutionary adaptations or Darwinian adaptations that make them really good to be kind of like scary and frighten people away because why? They're apex predators. So an apex predator, oh my God. okay. So in many ecosystems, there is a thing called the apex predator. So this is a term used in biology. Um, so and it refers to, so you guys have seen, you guys have seen a food chain, right? So it's kind of, it kind of looks like a pyramid. Usually it's like some grass here at the bottom, and then maybe some bugs, some worms, birds, and then small mammals, and then big mammals, and then all the way at the top, or the apex, or the kokdegi, um, is the apex. So the apex is at the very, very top of the pyramid. And the animal that is at the top of the food chain, that is called the apex predator. And so a predator, that's a type of animal that goes out to hunt for its food. So an animal that eats only plants, or an herbivore, they would not really be considered to be a predator. However, animals like wolves, like lions, like mountain cats, those are predators because they have to go and they have to capture their food and usually kill it and eat it. So after spending a lot of time with this soft-hearted caveman, the wolf puppies went from being apex predators, really scary, kind of violent, um, probably very hungry, and they changed through Darwinian adaptations or evolution into floppy-eared friends. So here, this is called, um, so this type of language right here, floppy-eared friends, it's called an alliteration. And it's something that people do in English a lot to make something sound good. So for, for right here, so you guys know what rhyme is, right? So if I speak in rhyme all the time, uh, my confidence will climb. You can, you can say something like that. It doesn't have to be that stupid. So the opposite of a rhyme is called alliteration. So alliteration is when we use the same sound at the beginning of a word. So here it says floppy-eared friends, right? So floppy-eared pals doesn't sound quite so good. Or floppy-eared companions, eh, it sounds all right. But floppy-eared friends, it's very easy to say, and it, I don't, it has a kind of nice rhythm to it, right? So you'll notice if you read a lot of English literature or even newspaper articles or poetry, you'll notice that people use this literary trick called alliteration quite a lot. So just keep your mind out. So just keep your eye out for it. Okay, so like we said, the original theory, scientists assumed that the caveman, with his big, warm heart, adopted the wolf puppies, and that's how they became companions with humans. But when you think about it, that doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense, right? It's unlikely that humans living 15,000 to 40,000 years ago would have selected a carnivore, requiring four kilograms of meat per day as their new best friend. The wolf would have been a competitor for food, and even a potential threat. So um, we talked in the last slide about herbivores, animals that eat only plants, and also carnivores, animals that eat only meat. So wolves, they're carnivores, and they need four kilograms of meat every single day just to survive. You know, 
that's, that's a lot of meat. That's like, like probably this much meat. So if you think about it, if you go to a Sangupsai restaurant in Korea, usually the, the basic serving for one person is about 200, gra 200 grams, right? So this would be about 20 times that. And they have to eat that every single day. And in these days, it's not like you could just go to the store and buy meat. You had to hunt it yourself. And this was very difficult. It took a lot of time and it was also quite dangerous. So it doesn't actually make much sense for humans who were struggling simply to feed themselves and not die from starvation. Why would they pick a carnivore requiring so much meat to be their friend? It actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think about it, right? So the wolf would have been a competitor for food. So they would have been fighting for food. So maybe if the human you know, uses his spear, he kills a mammoth, now there's meat. But what if the wolf eats it all? Or even if they say they're your friend, if they're really, really hungry, you know, humans were also made out of meat. The wolf could potentially try to eat us. This is why throughout history, usually humans have stayed away from wolves. So when you think about it that way, it's kind of interesting. And it kind of makes you think about, hmm, you know, maybe it is possible that wolves were the first one to approach humans because they don't stand to lose anything by being our friend. And, you know, we both could stand to gain something. So many scientists think that it's more likely that dogs domesticated themselves. A theory called survival of the friendliest. So um, if you guys have studied Charles Darwin and evolution, perhaps you've heard the phrase survival of the fittest. So survival of the fittest, that means the, the species that have the Darwinian adaptations or features that make it more likely for them to survive and to reproduce, those are the ones who are going to keep living on for hundreds, thousands, or even millions of years. So here, this is a little bit of a play on words or a pun. Um, so, so dogs, you know, they could have developed maybe sharper teeth or longer claws to survive, but instead they domesticated themselves by being friendly. And so this theory is called survival of the friendliest. So it's not an official phrase, but it's kind of a play on words and the scientists do actually use this. In order to become appealing to humans and potentially avoid becoming the victim of a spear or arrow, wolves developed fluffy tails, spotted coats, and even the ability to read human facial and body gestures. So if, if wolves want to you know, be friendly, if they want to be the victors of this survival of the friendliest theory, First, they have to appeal to humans. They have to make themselves look cute or attractive to, to humans. And the way, and the reason why probably they wanted to do this is so they could avoid becoming the victim of a spear or arrow. So back in the day, like I said, it's not like you could go to the store and just buy meat whenever you wanted. You had to go outside and kill the animal yourself. And this is really, you know, difficult and dangerous. And so back in the day, People would mostly use a spear, which is a long stick, usually with a sharp stone at the end. So if you throw it, it can, you know, cut through and p potentially kill an animal. Or they would use a bow and arrow, which looks kind of like this. So, so the wolves, they also don't want to get hit by a spear or by an arrow because, you know, it's dangerous for them too. So actually, it's smarter for them to try to appeal to humans, try to, you know, be really cute, but, oh, be my friend. And the way that they did this is by developing fluffy tails, spotted coats, and the ability to read human facial expressions and body gestures. So one of the most important things that humans have that sets them apart from animals is our ability to communicate using language. And so even, even when I'm making this video, uh, I probably made a lot of facial expressions, as well as body gestures. And actually, if you, if you have a dog at home, a lot of times, you know, if you're sad, if you're angry, if you're excited, uh, your dog will notice and your dog will try to respond to make you feel better or to join in your happiness. So this is actually a very interesting 
ability and one that not very many animals possess. All right, this is the last sentence. The evidence is still out as to which theory is correct, but one thing is certain. Canis lupus familiaris make excellent pets and friends. So here, when we say the evidence is out, that means we still don't know for sure. We're still not certain. We still need to collect more evidence before we can say definitively, oh, wolves domesticated themselves or humans domesticated wolves. Um, so we don't know which one is correct 100% just yet. But one thing is certain. Canis lupus familiaris, this is the scientific name for a dog that could perhaps live in your house. They make excellent pets and friends. So I can definitely agree with that. Oh, I really miss my dogs. I don't know, maybe I should get a dog while I'm here in Korea. All right, that is all for today's video. I hope that all of you guys had a great time watching it and learning about man's best friend and how that relationship came to be. If you enjoyed the video today, make sure to press like and subscribe at the bottom of this video. And if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, make sure to let us know in the comment section below. All right, everybody have a great day and I'll see you all again next week. Bye.